are we able to draw the lessons from the pandemic um, in terms of prevention, preparedness, in terms also of addressing a major failure of all of us during the crisis, which was the, has been the unequal, dramatically unequal access to vaccines across the world. That's the topic that El Storelli, who is a fellow with the Institute uh, of, uh, uh, sorry, Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London will now address. May I just ask all our speakers to stick to their time as we are already a little late on the program. Else, the floor is yours and thank you. Hope you feel better. Thank you, Michel, for the kind introduction and, and for the well, uh, good wishes. I uh, have recovered. Meanwhile, I was just confirmed myself uh, testing negative this morning. So, uh, but unfortunately, I couldn't travel to, to be with you. And, and yes, what, what I will uh, look at or talk about in the, in the next uh, 10 minutes is really uh, looking back to the COVID response, uh, I think, in addition to all the, the non-pharmaceutical interventions that Antoine uh, eloquently talked about, I think one major success stood out, which is our collective scientific community came together and in a record time was able to create and produce effective vaccines that have dramatically limited the risk of severe death, uh, severe disease and, and, and death uh, during, during uh, COVID. We were also lucky, we have to admit that, uh, the bet that scientists made uh, that this uh, famous spike protein would indeed be able to elicit an adequate re immune response paid off. And also several of the existing vaccine technology platforms uh, from the classic attenuated viruses to these newer uh, viral vector platforms and especially at uh, the meanwhile famous a messenger RNA, mRNA platform, they could rapidly be adapted to this new virus. And this was not just luck, this was also the result of massive investments, public uh, and taxpayers' uh, investments into research and development over many years, and then of course massive investments uh, during uh, the response. However, as, as indicated already by Michel, the main failure of our collective COVID response has been that large parts of the world were precluded from the timely and equitable access uh, to these life-saving vaccines that would have been able to avoid many more uh, deaths and probably would also have been much more effective in controlling uh, the pandemic. And just uh, to, to, uh, for, for, um, uh, to remind you that 15 months after the vaccines became available, mainly in high-income countries, and where even persons with very low risks of getting ill, including children, were being vaccinated, most countries in Africa had not been able to vaccinate even their healthcare workers that were at the first line and at high risk of, of getting ill or the most vulnerable populations. And as you know, the risk of dying increases uh, significantly with age and with uh, co-infections or comorbidities. Uh, and so those people, because that is what equity means, right? Equity means that those who need it most, those that are at that highest risk of getting ill, should be prioritized. And that is not at all what we did. And that was at the extreme inequity that Dr. Tedros, the director of the World Health Organization, referred to as vaccine apartheid. That is really uh, what happened. So are we ready for the next pandemic uh, to do better in terms of vaccine equity or countermeasure uh, equity, because it's not just vaccines, it's also access to diagnostics and, and treatments. Now, in order to respond to that, we need to understand why we ended there. And there are many factors that contributed. Uh, the initial scarcity uh, led to hoarding and vaccine nationalism with countries buying up all the stocks of these newly produced vaccines to be able, again, to vaccinate their whole population, even multiple times, while other uh, countries were precluded to even buy uh, vaccines for their health workers. But also a very important reason was that a handful of companies held monopolies on the science and technology and therefore controlled the production and availability of these vaccines and were able to actually decide 
how much to produce, when, to whom to sell, and at what price. And while wielding monopoly power to control maxi markets and maximize revenues may be normal business practice in many economic sectors, but here we're talking life-saving vaccines, developed moreover with massive public investments, and we're in the biggest health crisis of our lifetime. And so while it was astounding that many normal business practices were interrupted or dramatically changed, I mean, think about lockdowns. I mean, we've never done such a dramatic intervention in our economy. Somehow the powers that be didn't think that it was needed to do something about uh, the pharmaceutical business ecosystem and trusting that the market mechanisms could be uh, relied upon to deliver. And so we know uh, how that ended. Now, we have to acknowledge that some vaccine producers, uh, AstraZeneca together with the Oxford uh, vaccine, and some Chinese producers did enable some local production in a few countries, but this was largely insufficient. It was too little too late uh, to really supply the, wor the world. And many producers that were trying to obtain such licenses were refused. And here, very importantly, the producers of the mRNA vaccines that became very quickly the preferred option in many countries, they totally refused to, refused to share their technology, instead doubling down on scaling up their own production capabilities. And this was even more dramatic because one of the key advantages of this novel technology that it's actually relatively easy to produce as compared to traditional vaccines, it's also very suitable for this decentralized medium scale production, and they can quickly be adapted to new variants. But both Moderna and Pfizer and Biotech chose to keep tight control of their technology. So what is it that we must do differently? The first is to really have a change of perspectives. Life-saving health technologies, especially in times of pandemics, cannot be viewed as private commercial goods. This should, first of all, be considered as essential public health tools, instruments for public policy. And that's not a technical issue. That is really a political choice. And it means also that policymakers must be able to use and, uh, these tools and implement such policies as they see fit to control the pandemic. And in wealthy countries, the market-based pharmaceutical ecosystem may be able to deliver. And that's clearly what most Western policymakers think. Uh, but as we have seen, that doesn't deliver for the rest of the world. And so governments in other parts of the world were not able to use these tools to implement the best public health response. They, could, they couldn't buy and they couldn't produce. So what can we do to ensure that countries in the global south, and we're talking actually about a majority of the world population, eh, let's be clear, can do differently to secure the health of their populations? Well, what they say is, we do no longer want to be recipients and beggars. We actually want to be part of the solutions to contribute as full participants to the research and development of diagnostics, vaccines and treatments, and to be able to respond to epidemic outbreaks when and where they occur, not waiting until it is uh, a pandemic, but actually, or waiting until Western pharmaceutical business uh, models develop the products that we can use to uh, uh, stop outbreaks when and where they occur. And so for that, what they need is access to the technologies and the know-how for health innovation and the freedom to, to, to do research and produce without any uh, constraints such as intellectual property rights, which again are a policy tool, they're not a natural right. And you also need access to, of course, the capital to build and sustain the needed infrastructure, for instance, through regional R&D hubs. And of course, all of this, that it needs to be considered as common goods for health, not private commodities for business, because we're talking about uh, the biggest life, uh, health crisis in our lifetime and maybe future ones. Um, and so you all know the, the saying, eh, give a person a fish, a fish and they will eat today, teach them how to fish, and especially allow them to fish in the collective knowledge point, and they will actually be able to take care of themselves. And because that's actually what we do today, we stop them from actually using the knowledge and technology to develop their own uh, solutions. And again, this is a political choice. 
uh, for, for that we have done. And we know in military, there is this concept of technological arms race and you don't want to share your technology, but it's a mistake. And actually we do it too often to compare health security with uh, military security. And it's a mistake to use that language and that thinking and that narrative for global public health. Health threats are very different. Advantages in health technologies in one country do not translate in health security. No one is safe until everybody is safe against epidemic threats. We all know that viruses and other uh, pathogens, they cannot, cannot be contained by borders. And that's why it's so critical that more countries and regions are allowed to and empowered to be part of that health innovation ecosystem, not as competitors in a global market, but as contributors to global health security that then can be viewed as a global common good. And so that is, the essence, in essence, the type of transformational change we need for true preparedness. And that will allow to put equity at its heart, as demanded today by many global uh, South countries, for instance, in the discussions about uh, the, the uh, pandemic treaty. That is what they, that they want, to be allowed to establish maybe a parallel ecosystem in other parts of the world. We don't, we can, if the Western world says we want to continue how we do it, fine. But can we create a space such that in other parts of the world, there can be different ways of uh, addressing that? And this is not utopic. For today, for instance, there is an initiative driven by the World Health Organization in which uh, a, a hub for mRNA technology has been created in South Africa and where this technology is being shared with researchers and developers and companies in 15 other middle income countries such that they can actually develop uh, their own mRNA based health uh, tools, vaccines and other uh, maybe treatments to protect themselves against uh, the health threats that they are facing. We also yes, have I'm Brazil, sorry, I will instance. ask you to come to the conclusion. Sorry. Yes, yeah. sorry, Michel. I'm, as you know, I uh, <laughs> tend to be a little bit long winding because this is such an important topic. Maybe just one final, final thing to say is that uh, quite often uh, what we, we, we hear today is that there is investments in local manufacturing capacity. Now that will not by itself create the equity we need. What we need is to actually share the knowledge and technology uh, uh, such that uh, developers and researchers in the Global South are no longer dependent on the charity uh, response of the, the Global North uh, of the, of the, and, and that they actually can develop the solutions they need uh, for their own health needs. And so one final line, health security cannot be gained by technological competition and business as usual. It's not a war against each other for technolo technological dominance. It actually requires collaboration and sharing because we are all in this together against the virus. I thank you. Thank you very much, Els. Um <laughs>